Oh, first let me finish with the, um, the fallout and the black rain. Uh, so this report just came out in December from the Radiation Effects Research Foundation. And they asked people about exposure to black rain. They asked the survivors. And uh, of the 86,671 survivors in the primary analyses that give us our risk estimates, um, 12,000 approximately said yes, but over 21,000, there's no information. And this is something I want to um, emphasize, is that the lack of data, missing data, is a big problem in the lifespan study that could be investigated more, but has been ignored for a half century. Um, RERF has also reported this December on the mortality rates between 1950 and 2003 on the left, and between 1962 and 2003 on the right uh, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the excess relative risk, which uh, zero is, indicates the referent group that's not exposed to fallout, um, that the group reporting exposure to black rain in both cities has no difference in mortality over either time period. But the unknown group in both cities has an excess mortality. It's 27% in Hiroshima and 46% in Nagasaki and if you look at the difference between 1950 to 2003, those estimates I just cited, there's basically no difference in the period 1962 to 2003. This means that during, during the period 1950 and 1962, there was a very large excess mortality among people who provided no information on their exposure to black rain. And that's a very important time period that I'll come back to in a minute. Now let's talk about the early entrants, the people who could have been exposed to induced radiation uh, at, near the hypocenter. Um, here are some dose estimates for days two and three for people who would have spent 12 hours from RERF. Uh, we don't have any estimates from them for day one, but we know that induced radiation fell off very rapidly. Um, these are photographs from Yosuke Yamahata taken the day after the bombing of Nagasaki. And what I want you to notice is that people are there. And these are not the people who were exposed at the hypercenter. These are people who are coming in from other areas. They're going through the city. Some of them are looking for their relatives. When I was in Nagasaki, I had the opportunity to tour the museum there with a survivor who knew the woman on the left, on the right side of this photograph and uh, explained to me that she was still living, this was just about five years ago, and that this photograph, she found her, mo her mother. But people were there, and they were not the people who were most exposed to the blast. They were tended to be people from further away. So that's a differential exposure again to a type of radiation that is not counted in the lifespan study. Now, the next few slides I want to share are from our group at University of North Carolina. Uh, what they show for Hiroshima and Nagasaki are the uh, distances from hypocenter of three groups of people. The proximal survivors in the first panel, the distal survivors in the second panel, and the survivors with missing dose in the third panel. And you can see that only proximal survivors could have missing dose. That's because the uh, RERF did not require detailed interviews with distal survivors to produce a dose estimate. They were all assigned to the lowest dose category. This forces a relationship between missing dose and exposure. You can only have a missing dose if you're exposed. Now, um, 
here's the same situation occurs in Nagasaki. Now, what does that mean in terms of the lifespan study? Um, this table shows us that in the 1950s, there were higher rates of mortality among survivors with unknown doses from all causes, from all cancers, and from leukemia. So here we're taking out of the high dose group people with high mortality rates. What does that do to the dose response estimate? If we remove the high mortality individuals from the groups with the higher doses? I think it's obvious. So let me move on. Um, and, and first remind you, oh, oh, I must mention one other thing about this period between 1950 and the early 1960s. In 1950, all, all survivors were entered into follow-up on October 1st, 1950. However, all survivors had not completed sufficient interviews to be assigned a dose at that time. The interviews needed to assign a dose continued until 1965. Yet RERF, in all their analyses, to estimate these risk coefficients that are applied to populations around the world, have entered people and on October 1st, 1950, who could not be in the study until later. It's a phenomenon that epidemiologists call immortal person time. What this does is it inflates the denominator of the rates, of the, the cancer rates, for the proximal survivors. So this is another phenomenon that causes an underestimate of the cancer rates for the proximal survivors. So we have another source of bias. This is, uh, I'm not aware that this has been written about, but you could find it in our recent paper in American Journal of Epidemiology. Now, there are a couple of other things to say about the lifespan study. We don't have information about the carcinogenic effect, effects of in utero exposures, which are clearly very important. Uh, the embryo and fetus are clearly very sensitive to the carcinogenic effects of radiation, probably much more so than, than children. But the, the lifespan study doesn't give us information on that at all. And therefore, that uh, effect is left out of many of the dose estimates that are that we typically see. So I want to talk quickly about now four epidemiologic studies, uh, where my message here is what is projected based on the lifespan study of ABOM survivors and what has been seen in the epidemiologic studies. Uh, this is a graph from David Brenner, who spoke yesterday. Uh, estimating the number of people who would be needed need to be followed for life to detect an increase in cancer mortality based on the lifespan study estimates. And you can see that at low doses, under uh, 50 milligray or so, uh, we're talking about hundreds of thousands to millions of people, according to these estimates. So I learned about this first. I started working on radiation in 1998 when I was... Um, assigned to lead a study of the mortality of workers from Oak Ridge National Laboratory whose radiation doses had been monitored from very early on with individual badges. You can see here workers putting their, um, their radiation meters in the proper boxes. And I was told we would not find any effect of radiation in this population because it was too small and the doses were too low. So my first um, encounter with 
the dominant wisdom in this field was when we found that only after about 20 years latency we were seeing dose-response relationships. The higher the readings on the badges, the higher the cancer rates of the workers. But this was impossible, I was told.